Greetings and welcome to the Mount Rushmore podcast. I hope you like this episode. Richard <laughs> and oh, Michael are here. Know. What do you think, guys? I don't know. Maybe we don't like it. I don't know. Uh, my name is Jeff and I'm joined as always by my good friends. I hope they're my good friends, Richard. <laughs> Hello. And Michael. Howdy. Uh, these Worry guys... not, Jeffrey. <laughs> Worry not. I will cut to the chase. Uh, we are uh, debating and deliberating the Mount Rushmore of worrying or worriers. And this was whose choice? This was a, a Michael Winfield joint. A joint. Yep. Um, and one of my picks is going to be the explanation. But I, I thought that um, worrying is such an interesting kind of aspect of fear because sometimes it's based on something real sometimes it's based on like a perceived thing but it's it's never really worrying or worriers the thing that they're worrying or worrying about isn't necessarily the most dangerous thing yet you've <laughs> kind of built up some sort of like just i don't know uh, maybe it's just the parent in me now uh, kind of thinking about my child and all the times that i've been like don't climb up that to the next rung of that ladder because I know you. And I think that's, I think that's <laughs> part of it. I think that there's a, uh, a knowledge that uh, betrays whatever the situation is. I don't think worrying comes out of like a lack of notion. I think it comes out of like, Oh, I know what could go wrong here. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I just thought, uh, hey. So worry, worry seems to be kind of readiness to its extreme, or to mm. where readiness meets illogic, or something like that, or no? Yeah, I think that there's a Venn diagram of a bunch of different things that are, yeah, um, kind of all overlapping and oh, getting, as the police in each other's way. Yeah. The, oh, is that for <laughs> me? Yeah, they're coming after you. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, okay, Michael chose it. So, Richard, what's your first worry or worrier? Not warrior. Oh. Not not a warrior, not yeah. Steph Curry. No, um, even though maybe Steph Curry worries a lot. Maybe it I'm is. not going to make this shot. What if they don't? What if they get mad if I miss this shot? <laughs> that sounds like the Stuart Smalley episode of uh, <laughs> Michael <laughs> Jordan. Yeah, <laughs> put the hoop in the ball in the hoop. <laughs> um, so I went with the first warrior that I could think of, and that is Sesame Street's Telly Monster. Oh, super oh, wow. choice. Oh, that's a fun choice. Yeah, the five-year-old purple monster who is just constantly racked with anxiety and worry that something, anytime they're doing something, that something bad might happen. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't realize that his original name was Television Monster, mm -hmm. and that he was designed to be a monster who watched too much television. Oh. And he, uh, I'll see if I can send you the photo over chat here. Yeah, the first image is, I think the first picture of him, he had kind of like crazy TV eyes and uh, maybe some sort of antenna or something. So yeah, I just sent it to you in the 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 wiki, the Muppet wiki in the chat. And if you scroll <laughs> down a little bit, you can see what the original telly monster looked like. And he so is the, the children's a, television workshop is. thought that wasn't a good idea? <laughs> Yeah, apparently they, apparently they realized that they were probably encouraging kids to sit too close to the television. Oh. Because he had like these eyes that would like, like they were like the spiral eyes and they would whirl around whenever he watched TV. And oh. yeah, like Michael said, he had antennas for, for horns and uh, real nightmare fuel type stuff, actually. <laughs> um, but he eventually evolved into the lovable five-year-old monster that we know today. And... I just think that Telly Monster is a a great a, was a great addition to Sesame Street because, like Michael kind of alluded to this, I think in the in the opening. When, once you have kids, you realize kids are big warriors, and especially some kids are more than more so than others. Like I know Simon, my son, is a complete warrior and just he just gets worried about every little. You know, he's, he's 10 and he still has trouble going to sleep at night by himself because he's worried about everything that could go wrong if he tries to go to sleep. And so Telly Monster is, I think, a great example for kids that it's okay to be worried about things. 
that everyone gets worried about stuff. But even though you're worried about something, it doesn't mean that something bad is going to happen. And I think that's a that's a great message to share mm-hmm. with 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 the youths of today. That's interesting. The correlation between uh, the effort to uh, manifestation or uh, eventuality of catastrophe <laughs> that right. I'm, I'm out of worrying is related to it because I, I in a some some way I always think it's preparedness to consider what can go wrong right so that's FEMA <laughs> their job is to kind of right <laughs> worry yeah but, I mean uh, I think there's a difference between normal preparedness then there's some sort of line where you go from natural worry to yeah. unnatural worry. And that's what Telly Monster kind of represents is that, that like just being scared of every, that any, anytime something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Yeah. Type thing. Yeah. Uh, bravery is, is being afraid and then moving forward. Is the bravest thing yeah. you could do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, I, what, what season was that? Cause I, I'm fascinated with, te- with, uh, Muppets in general, even though I don't know if ever Ses- every character on Sesame Street is a Muppet, but like when they arrive, and if so, what uh, was Joan Gans Cooney and the other <laughs> folks trying to tell us or do accomplish when they the, came uh, along? The television monster came along in season 10, and then they got rid of him quickly. And then in the next season, so season 11, is when Telly came back as Big Bird's new little monster pal. I do appreciate Sesame Street's willingness to kind of evolve their characters and change them to kind of match the, uh, you know, the the worries and the the issues and the struggles of whatever whatever new thing has come up. So, you know, some stuff is so universal, but some stuff is so specific to, you know, an age or a few couple of years or whatever it is. I mean, you know, they're. Very, very dedicated and very, very um, observant on what's going on. I was, I was surprised with the season eighteen episode uh, entitled "Telly Starts Cymbalta," <laughs> which I thought was a bit of a swerve for the character. But I'm, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Obviously, I totally agree with you, Michael. Uh, okay, Michael, what's your first one? Well, my first one, I'll, I'll choose. I'll move this up. I'll choose the one that kind of made me why I was inspired to make this. Uh, choose this topic which is i was watching a baseball game the other night or it was about a month ago and it was um the dodgers were playing the rockies and they were in colorado and the dodgers late in the game were up something like 11 to nothing the game ended up being a 13 to 0 um kind of route but on the steps is Dave Roberts, the manager of the Dodgers, just watching every pitch, just worrying about every pitch, just like, like he's concerned about balls and strikes in, you know, the top of the eighth inning when they're just destroying this team. Hmm. And I thought about just coaches and manor managers in general and Dave Roberts in specifically about how their entire job is just built on, worrying that something's going to go wrong and in i I, you know in dave roberts case the daughters are a very good team um not only a very good hitting team but a very good pitching team so the idea that they'd lose at that point seems crazy but he was up there you know kind of like just worrying his ass off and it's so strange (laughs) and it could be that thing that we talked about this like preparedness like in Colorado, a score can quickly jump, can quickly turn around. You know, you could be up six to one and then an inning and a half later, you could be down eight to six. You know, it's like it's a place they score a ton of runs or everybody can. But I don't know. I, I just thought about like football coaches and these guys that like put in 80 hours into their week, if not 100 hours. That's just. Uh, they're they're driving themselves crazy because they know all the things that could go wrong and or or how they could be better and uh, I don't know it. That coach that coach. So is, so is so is your choice 
managers worrying about everything? Is that Basic, your choice? Basically, basically. yeah. <laughs> okay. Does it yeah, seem like I, the manager is like, like in this case, is like, uh, you ever meet uh, very wealthy people who are worried about every penny? Like even if they're uh, in a wealth of runs or, or <laughs> they're outscoring their opponent, they're still worried about how they could lose it. Yeah. Uh, what were you going to say, Richard? No, I was just going to say I like that choice um, I, because I think I think you have to be a control freak to be a manager. Mm. That kind of comes with the territory. You know, you're in charge of, you know, tw- you know, however many players are on the roster at the time, plus, you know, you know, later in the season, like, so if, say a 40 man roster plus coaches, plus everyone else, and you're having to manage up with you, the GM. And I think that, I think that it, it's, it's an, or it's a, it's a, it's a profession that, that encourages people to be nervous in the eighth inning of an 11, nothing game. Cause you know, you could, one of your guys could slip on a bat, crack his ankle. <laughs> you never know. I lo- strange I love- things, strange things could happen, you know, slip on a rosin bag. Does it also look bad no matter what to look like a person who's gloating over there? There uh, is that hubris. Dude. Yeah, that's the, that's pride coming before a fall there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it would be weird if the manager in like the sixth inning is like, you know, it's eleven nothing. I'm done. I'm clocking out. <laughs> Going back to the dugout. <laughs> Third base coach, you got this. We're good. Go yeah, wake, maybe, wake wake me if you need anything. I'll be asleep. Maybe there is some performance in it because, um, that's funny. That's really funny, Richard. Did you look down and you saw he had like a. Uh, uh, Nintendo Twitch in his hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or Switch. Do, 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 do. Uh, okay, Richard, what's your second one? My second one is a personal one for me. Um, this is an example of the fact that Simon is a warrior and he gets it naturally. Um, when we went to Australia a few years ago, I spent an entire 14-hour flight panicking that I had somehow screwed up the visa uh, Mm. issues that you have to clear in order to fly into Australia. And I was just convinced that we were going to land and they're going to say, well, there's a problem with your visa. You have to turn around and leave. Mm. I was just absolutely convinced that I was said somehow screwed things up Mm -hmm. and it was going to come back to bite the whole family and ruin our Australia vacation didn't but i spent 14 uh, you know just the whole like lead up to the flight first off i wanted to make sure that i i must have asked sarah 20 times during the course of the day you have the passports right yes they're in my backpack okay 20 minutes later you sure they're in the backpack right (laughs) the fact that she didn't throttle me with said backpack by the end of the trip was a minor miracle and a uh, an example of how uh, how understanding she is of my personal anxiety and weirdness. But yeah, because whenever you apply for your visa, it just gets attached to your electronically to your passport record. Oh. So whenever they scan your passport, it can pop up and it shows that you've completed all your visa paperwork. But you don't get a confirmation that says, "Well, congratulations, your pa- your visa has been approved. You're all mm-hmm. set." Yeah. And that just freaked the fuck out me the fuck out. I just I wanted to have something that told me mm-hmm. yes, this is completed. And the fact that I didn't get that led me into this like anxiety spiral where I to the point where I basically couldn't sleep for a 14-hour flight. I was so nervous about this. Mm-hmm. I think the only thing that should have put your mind to rest is that you're going to Australia and they don't give a shit about anything. That's true. <laughs> you just fly down. It's like, I don't know, whatever. Everything's fine here. Just have a beer. You're good. Yeah. You're going to be, you're going to be stung by a venomous bottle spider as soon as you get off, <laughs> off the plane. So it's really not much of a concern, much of a concern. Are, are you, once you, you know, there are times when I've stuffed my 
ID or passport in my bag, and then I have to check it three times. So even if oh, she yeah. had it, would you still need it to double? double oh yeah. Check so it? yeah, I was like, can you check it and just make sure? I know he did that multiple times during during the airport trip and the yeah. Oh, it was. I a, a, I must have been a monumental pain in the ass. Not that you guys would <laughs> would understand that. Okay, but. so what? sometimes um, our behaviors are shaped by past trauma. What have you fumbled in the past, Mr. Manfred? Mm. I don't know. I can't remember any time where I've, I've dropped the bag to that level. Um, maybe it's, you know, and maybe it's, maybe it's to my, maybe it's to my advantage. Maybe I would have at some point if I wasn't this nervous oh, okay. and anxious about little details like this. I mean, it's okay. the, look, it's the, it's, it's, it's not that far removed from, did I turn the stove off? Yeah. It's, it's, it's in that same world. Okay. Richard, you would have made a terrible Jason Bourne. Just, yes. <laughs> just, well, just, well, uh, 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 25 <laughs> different passports. I don't know, don't know which one. I, is, is my name, <laughs> it's my name on this one. Oh shit. Oh, yeah, basically. <laughs> Uh, I'm really interested in though the uh, some persons who have either neglectful parents or uh, um, absent parents uh, develop this kind of self parent identity, and that self parent is always talking to them, always telling them things that they that they uh, will probably forget or mess up on because they're they're a dummy, <laughs> and the self parent is it's you, but right. it's. It's the person that you developed as a coping mechanism in the absence of that other person. It's usually not somebody who who's kind, you know, or right. understanding or trusting or who's on your side. They're this person who doesn't believe in you at all. Do you, do you, because this is therapy, do you think, uh, yeah, I know it's, <laughs> did you have something like that? No, I don't think so. The only thing I can think of is one time I left my CPAP machine at home when we went on vacation to Lake Tahoe. Oh. And that's something I'm – the other thing that I am – from that point forward, do we have the mm -hmm. CPAP machine? Yes. Yeah. We just go in the trunk and check, and I always have to check, make doubly sure before we leave. So yeah. that one I can – that one I can attribute to a past failure. Okay. But the the visa thing, I think it was just because I didn't I, I didn't get a confirmation about it. I think yeah. that just freaked me out. Yeah, I could see that. All right, Winfield, what's your second one? Uh, my third one. It's been a while since uh, we've second had a, one. my second one. Thank okay. you. Um, it's been a little while since I've pulled a Simpsons uh, character oh, wow. to talk about, but Marge Simpson, one oh. of the um, expert warriors, and I think the, the most rightfully so worrisome person based on uh, two of the people within uh, the Simpson household. Um Homer just being such a colossal dolt and uh, Bart being, you know, troublemaker to the stars. Uh, Marge, just her entire, she's got such this amazing tense energy that uh, she's convinced that everything is going to go wrong. Everything does go wrong, but then it's usually very well. I think hers is a worry that's built on, um, things reinforcing it <laughs> rather than someone uh, worrying about something uh, going wrong because it, just their imagination gets out of control. Um, but definitely Bart and Homer, uh, I think lead, lead to her being just so tense and uh, uh, concerned about every little thing within their kind of household. Um, I also think that uh, she, she seems to, you know, like all of the Simpsons characters, they, their traits tend to uh, filter down from one generation to another. And I think that her her mother seemed to have been a worrisome character. And uh, maybe even Patty and Selma have like that sense of maybe they're more disgruntled than worried. But mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think that there is like a, you know, like a generational a sense of worry that is passed down. They definitely seem that's an interesting shade of worry is pessimism. Um, Mar Marge seems like maybe she wakes up every day thinking the best, optimistic that uh, mm. 
everything's going to go well, but Patty and Selma don't have a positive thing to say about anybody. And when presented with the uh, um, n- new, they don't, don't seem like they're on the sunny side of the street. Um, but uh, yeah, that's interesting. The things that are worrying or aren't worrying, like Marge definitely, like you said, has earned that um, behavior based on well, all the I times mean- everybody's let her down. And she's also the, has to be the counterbalance to Homer, mm-hmm. who doesn't yeah. worry about anything because he's just a big dummy who just sort of floats through life and things happen to him. Yeah. So there <laughs> needs to be some sort of, some big counterbalance to that in the family and in the show. And that's, that's Marge. Mm-hmm. Do you, I have in my life been the person who um, uh, told my wife she was worrying too much. And then mm-hmm. usually within a minute, uh, it was completely justified <laughs> the reason she worried because I dropped the ball and something like that. But my question with myself sometimes is um, what would happen if everything was okay? Would that be, is that a different type of hellscape? <laughs> you know, you know, I don't know. The That's interesting. Uh, I tend to be someone that doesn't worry too much. I kind of, um, I don't know if I've convinced myself or have it just experienced that things will work out eh, for the most part, for the better. Yeah. I mean, look, it's been two months since I was hit by a car and uh, <laughs> true, doing okay. You know, I mean, nothing crazy right now. I don't know. I got hit by a car crossing the street. I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, that's something that's working out for me. That's something to be optimistic about. Well, you know, you did talk about the matchup of Marge and Homer. Um, uh, I have seen some uh, warriors and um, um, blissful, blissfully ignorant people <laughs> make, making good couples because uh, um, one needs the other <laughs> often. So. Yeah, I think that's yeah. just like Richard said. Is, is she, she balances out his, um, his idiocy uh, and his um, uh, obliviousness to anything. Yeah. You know, I think you're both right. I think they're both. I bet Marge wakes up optimistic, and yeah. Homer is just optimistic because he's doesn't know any better. Mm-hmm. And I think by the end of the day, probably Marge's hair's gone a little bit more gray and uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, all that. Yeah. Okay, we are at halftime, and uh, we want to invite you to go avail yourself of six years of Mount Rushmore. Um, we were starting this podcast when the uh, monument that is now Mont Rushmore is still being carved. It's true. Um, yeah. What was it called? Like the with Grandfather Rock or something? I forget something. I've never seen the Rushmore beforehand. It already looked like there were some figures on it or something like huh. that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, go back, download, rate, and review past episodes. We'd love to uh, uh, know which ones you like and then suggest a future topic if you want to hit us up on the socials, on Instagram, on Twitter, on ZipZop, on Flippity Flu. Uh, we're mm-hmm. on uh, Truth. We're, the, we're the who's he what to... Yeah. <laughs> we're not on Donald Trump. Trump on? We're not on <laughs> Truth. Truth. That's, That's the one we're not on. on. That's the one we're not on. <laughs> Um, we should, maybe we should, guys. I don't know. <laughs> okay, next we're back. Week, in next, that. next week's topic: Mount Rushmore of why the election was stolen. Yeah, why the hell? Yeah. <laughs> um, Richard, your third. All right, my third choice. Um, I'm going to keep it psychological for a minute. Ooh. Um, and go with something that I think a lot of people can relate to who are listening. Um, and that is imposter syndrome. Ooh. Oh. The idea that somehow whatever you're doing is secretly not good enough and you're going to be found out. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting. This is interesting to me because I have that to some extent. I think most people, if they're being honest with themselves, have had moments of this in the past. Maybe it's not a full time thing. And I think maybe there's a difference between having moments of doubt versus constant doubt. And maybe that's where the syndrome part comes in. But I think most people can relate to having that feeling of I'm in over my head here. Yeah. They're going to figure that someone's got to, someone's got to figure this out. Right. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that it's something that just 
primarily happens to overachieving people to begin with. Hmm. You know, if you're the, us, you know, the, the, the male work in the mail room at a law firm, you're probably not thinking, Oh God, they're going to figure out that I don't know how to sort these letters properly. Uh That's probably not part of your thought process. But if you're a lawyer at that law firm, much more likely that you're going to have imposter syndrome and feel like that you really don't belong and that they're, you're going to get caught. Uh So I find that interesting that it's something that really is the fact that you have imposter syndrome is a sign that you're a high achiever and that you actually shouldn't have to worry about imposter syndrome because you deserve whatever it is, the rewards that you're getting. Hmm. Do you feel like, uh, I feel like I relate my first imposter syndrome was I would just, even when having a job and still feeling like a kid, it's like, I'm too young for this or the people I know who do this kind of thing seem like adults and I don't, feel like an adult yet. Yeah. There was an element of that when I first started um, doing public relations, I worked at a small PR firm and I became sort of head of account services relatively quickly because somebody left and I got promoted. And so I was in charge of everyone else who was working there. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like I was probably what, 24, 25 at the time. Yeah. And it just felt like, why would anyone take orders from me? <laughs> the snot-nosed kid. I wouldn't take <laughs> orders from me. Why would anybody else? Mm-hmm. Um, and then as you get older, you kind of work your way through that and sort of realize, no, I, I, I can handle this. Yeah. Um, so like I said, I think that it's, I think it's something a lot of people think they have, but I think there is a big difference between occasionally feeling that way because you know, you, you've got a really tough assignment and you're feeling like that you're struggling to, to do all the tasks versus having a the syndrome, which I think is the constant weight of that over your head, no matter what you're doing and no matter how successful you're being. And to the point where being successful actually makes it feel worse. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm just fascinated by that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's so funny. I feel like I used to have imposter syndrome and now i have in in a professional workplace and now i have the feeling like oh god this can't really be my job can it (laughs) (laughs) oh no i can't really be the one who's doing this job i don't know if Um, you guys have heard in the last couple of weeks this this uh idea of what quiet quitting or silent quitting you guys heard about this yeah it's you know so if you haven't if you're listening it's this idea that more and more people are deciding to work the bare minimum and not put effort into their jobs, but they don't want to quit their jobs because they don't want to leave the paycheck behind. So they're just kind of coasting through the day. Mm. And I remember just thinking to myself, when I heard that was this, I was like, doesn't everybody do this? <laughs> is that just having a job? Isn't that just, isn't that just working in a capitalist system? Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. When they, when you ask for a raise and they say, no, that's how you get a raise by working. <laughs> Working less, yeah. Working less. The um, uh, the company that I work for uh, is a staffing company, and what has often happened is they'll go through the process of, of like onboarding someone, not even uh, like uh, like some sort of consultant or a contractor who's like our job. Our company's job is to get other people's jobs or to work with companies to pair them with a client and the consultant so they can have a job or whatever. But you know, when we're trying to bring someone on to work as like an employee for our company specifically um they'll go through this huge process of you know interviewing and uh, background checks and uh you know agreeing to a start date and we're sending out equipment and laptops and stuff because they're working from home or whatever that's going on and then um then that person just never tells us that they've decided not to start working oh, wow. oh, boy. for our company and have taken another job. So there's this weird sense of not wanting to confront someone because mm-hmm. they've made another, another choice of like this ghosting of, um, mm-hmm. it almost feels like that. It almost feels like a quiet quitting of just like, I'm just not going to tell them that I'm not starting yeah. them and see if they notice. Maybe they'll pay me a two. 
yeah, maybe I'll get a paycheck for it. <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? Okay, uh, Win- Winfield, what's your third? Um, my third choice is the one that I um, kind of, uh, I'm not a terribly worrisome person, but it's the one that I, I do relate to and I do um, uh, do have like some uh, small anxiety is it's when um, when you're a parent or a spouse and you're kind of waiting up late for your spouse or child to come home. And like, obviously my five-year-old, um, I'm not at that point where he's, he's yeah. What's he, what's he doing? Going at work or something? He's burning the midnight oil. No, but like, uh, you know, every once in a while, uh, uh, Emily will like go over to a friend's house and stay out like really late, like super late. And, um, even though I try to commit myself to like going to bed or, um, uh, what have you. And, she, and she's like, not staying over to like her friend's house, a girlfriend's house. Like, uh, I'm, I, I'm just like, I can't sleep. I, I, I just kind of yeah, got to figure it out and wait to know that she's on her way home or, but I, but I won't like, you know, I'm sure she'll listen to this episode. Hi, darling. I, I, I don't want text her to like, Hey, let me know when you're leaving. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy. But yeah. internally, sometimes I'm that guy where it's just like, there's an anxiousness and a worrisome because you never know what could happen, especially super late at night. Um, and I, like, I get it. Like, I totally get it. Like, um, I think of that scene in um, Goodfellas when, uh, who's, the, who's the lead character that's, um, uh, what's his name? That Henry Hill. Or, yeah. Henry Hill is, you know, there, he's still kind of staying at, his wife's parents house or whatever yeah. <laughs> he still lives. I don't know why <laughs> I haven't figured out why he still lives there, even though they're married. Um, but like he walks in the door at like, you know, three in the morning or four in the morning on a Saturday or a Sunday morning. And like his parents start like yelling, her parents start like laying into him, like wearing like, you know, she's wearing like a yeah. like, old house dress and he just walks in the door Oh, it just rolls his eye, <laughs> turns around, so walks the other way, like back to his car. And, and then like the daughter, uh, his wife just starts yelling, mom, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, but like that, but I totally understand that feeling at times of just like, like just, you just want that person to be safe. Yeah. At, at late night stuff is always kind of just like, you don't know who else is on the road. You don't know what mm-hmm. other horrible situation can happen there's also something that uh a person's absence during the daytime is one thing but when Mm -hmm. you're lying in the bed and there's nothing on half of the bed (laughs) that for me is like i can't sleep when there's just a big empty space there yeah like and you know like the dog will sleep on the bed with me like as i'm kind of quasi trying to go to sleep and not really so it's like eh, Mm -hmm. not the same all right, uh, Richard, your last one. All right, I'm going to go back with the pop culture warrior for the last one, kind of after we kind of went psychological the last couple. Let's mm. let's pep it up a little bit. And I'm going to go with Cameron Fry from Ferris oh, Bueller's oh, wow. Day Off. Great. That's a funny one. Um, a character who actually experiences growth throughout the movie, which is something that Ferris Bueller's character doesn't, which makes you wonder, who is the real protagonist of Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Because while it is Ferris Bueller's movie, the character who actually undergoes the growth and changes and learns something throughout the course of the movie is Cameron. Yeah. Um, you know, I just love the initial introduction to him as he's just like, okay, he's going to keep calling. He's going to keep calling. He's not going to stop. <laughs> so you just are introduced to him like worrying about Ferris bugging him the whole time. And throughout the course of the movie, he is the sort of, okay, we shouldn't be doing this. He's somewhere between the voice of reason and the Woody Allen character Mm -hmm. of the movie. And obviously his biggest worry is letting down his dad or his parents and being seen as a failure. And then literally the worst thing that could possibly happen to him happens to him and he wrecks his dad's prized automobile. 
And going through that trauma makes him realize, you know what? I've been worrying about this and now it's happened and I'm just going to get through it. And it's almost like he had to go through that, the worst case scenario in order to get through his fear of the worst case scenario. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you can imagine the worst and you can be with that, then, then you've won. That you've conquered. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, obviously great movie, funny character, but I, Again, with almost like a Homer Simpson and Marge Simpson thing. You know, Ferris is so carefree and not giving two fucks about any of the consequences mm-hmm. to his actions. Yeah. You have to have somebody in there who is worried about the consequences of the act- of their actions mm-hmm. constantly. Does and Simone, that's where Cameron comes in. Do the other characters have... A, well, his sister definitely is looking for... I think some sense of justice, right? Like mm-hmm. the, the do gooder sister or the not do badder sister. Right. Isn't she <laughs> uh, beleaguered that Ferris doesn't ever uh, face any kind of consequences for his actions? Yeah. I mean, she's, she's less worried and more the anta- one of the antagonists. Of mm-hmm. it. Um, but she's punished with Charlie Sheen. That's the worst punishment anyone can have, of course. (laughs) But like I said, I just, I I think that if you didn't have that conflict, it would just be a movie of a kid goofing off all day. Cameron really is the heart of the film. Yeah. Even if Ferris is the one who the action revolves around. Yeah. And if you were getting kind of examining its existential qualities, like Cameron has the most he's he's in a way if he's not the main character he's he's the most dynamic one because he he changes from point a to point b um and uh so in a way cameron is the main character and ferris bueller is just the chaos of life of existence right (laughs) that that uh whirls into his his and the agent of chaos the agent of chaos exactly yeah and uh, Cameron is meditating at the beginning, hoping to stave it off and realizing he can't. <laughs> okay. This is fun. What a fun topic. I hope the audience liked it, you guys. Wait, Michael has one more, doesn't he? Oh, he does? Yeah. Oh, okay. What do you got, That's, Michael? You mean skip it. That's fine. Oh, I had typed Cameron Fry, then I typed Ferris Bueller <laughs> on you. Winfield, Winfield, what's your last one? Uh, my last one is uh, Tipper Gore and the PMRC. Ah. <laughs> what a bunch of worrying ninnies who are just so up in arms over the state of what music is saying and what it's, what's it doing to our children. Yep. I can't believe these songs that are about sex are singing about sex in a way that it's, it's not like a dance move from the 1950s. How dare they? <laughs> How dare Prince and Sheena Easton and Jeff Leppard and uh, yep. this Motley Twisted Crue. Sister. Twisted Sister, all these people. How dare they sing about drugs? How dare they? Oh, what are the kids going to do? What are they going to do? Oh, my goodness. I mean, really, the, the PMRC um, or the um, Parents Music Resource Center, which sounds like a place that you just, like, go to get, like, uh, whatever it is, that little lug nut that holds like symbols <laughs> onto a drum kit. Like, it's just like, it's, it's like, it sounds like the place that you go for like to fix all the shit that your kids drop on the way to school. Yeah. It's like the oboe is broken. Now it's like, God, yeah. what's what happened? Well, the reeds broke. Okay. We're getting to read at the PMRC. That's fine. Or like, I don't know. It's something's wrong with the, the tuba, but no, it's just um, in the, mid uh, to late 80s, it was a group of um, uh, politicians' wives that kind of had gotten together to uh, really try to force the music industry to regulate or limit um, kind of what they considered to be obscene music from uh, being sold to children and um, 
of course, it went to Senate hearings and it went to um, the ultimate resolution was kind of the music industry saying, okay, look, we'll put parental advisory stickers on uh, albums that have, um, you know, music that is, I don't know, suggestive, but at least had curse words. I don't know how they quite decided. Can you just like, can you, if you use a metaphor, is does that, yeah, does that work? Or is it just, is it just like the George Carlin mm -hmm. uh, seven, seven words you can't say on TV? I don't quite know, but all it seemed to do is generate more interest in music than otherwise. <laughs> like, is yeah. anybody really caring all that much about a song by, I don't know, Wasp or Merciful Fate or, I don't know, <laughs> Venom? It's just like the worrying nature of what not even just conservatives, but like a conservative mindset will do uh, is just pretty awful. Yeah. I remember reading that that not only back kind of backfired, but it also somehow it was tied to the, um, the demise of the long box, the CD long box mm. uh, was connected to that. Like ultimately the legislation that killed those stickers also was about the packaging of the CDs. And at the time, listeners who are of a certain age might remember that uh, retailers were persuaded to switch, were, were, were facilitated in their retailing of compact discs in the early days by their packaging included a, a cardboard extension that made them as tall as an album. Was. Yeah, they did. I, I loved. I love that. Like records, record stores just didn't want to get rid of the ten dollar wooden thing that displayed, you know, LPs. And they're like, yeah. "All right, what if we, what if we waste a whole bunch of paper just to put this thing in a, yeah, something the same size?" Quite and amazing. they had the opportunity to do it with cassettes too. They had long boxes for cassettes too. It's like so ridiculous. Yeah, uh, it's the amazing. BMRC, the only people that could make a. Bedfellows of John Denver and D. Snyder. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Frank two, Zappa. Two life crew. <laughs> Frank Zappa. Okay, let's pick some. And uh, why don't we go with um my cat's being weird. Uh why don't we go with uh Cameron Fry, because that's kind of fun. Let's go with uh Sully Monster, because who knew? Uh I love the idea of a coach um performative worrying, even though he knows he's crushed the opponent. Or or uh Avoiding the the uh, uh, fate of those who practice hubris by uh, actually worrying, and um, and because it was very personal, the um, staying up late worrying about uh, uh, loved ones. So that was awesome. Thanks, guys. This has been the Mount Rushmore of worrying. I'm always Jeff. I'm Richard. I'm Michael. Yay.